welcome to Beating the Odds, a spy story, an evening with Richard Diaz. I'm Amanda Olke. I'm a director of adult education at the International Spy Museum. Delighted that you're joining us this evening. We're really, really proud to offer this program in support of National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Um, our conversation is going to be led tonight by Dr. Andrew Hammond, our historian. Before I turn it over to him, I want to thank our sponsor this evening. Our presenting sponsor is HP, and I really want to thank our board member, Mary Kraft. She's a terrific, supportive board member of the International Spy Museum, and we really appreciate HP for allowing us to have programs like this and make them free because it is such an honor and a pleasure to be able to have someone like Rick Diaz with us. So without further ado, over to the really important people here. Andrew, please take it away. Well, this evening, I'm not important at all. Um, I'm just here to very briefly introduce Rick. Um, I just want to say a couple of quick thank yous before we begin. Uh, firstly, to Amanda and her team for putting on yet again uh, another fantastic public program. Um, they've really done a sterling job during the pandemic. Uh, please look at some of the videos on YouTube. The second shout out is to all the people at the museum who are turning up day after day and interacting with the public. Um, thank you. Um, okay. The final thing to say is that I'm going to be on the screen when Rick is talking. So if you're wondering why is this person trying to gate crash Rick's party, mm -hmm. I'm not. He, he, he asked if someone could be on screen so that he could see a face to react against. And um, goodness knows why he chose me, but he did. <laughs> um, OK, so Rick's story is fantastic. One of the things that I love about the history of espionage and intelligence it's just there are such great stories, and you're about to hear a real humdinger. Over to you, Rick. Good. Well, I wanted to thank you for the time to do this. Um, I'm humbled by the opportunity. Um, as I was trying to put this thing together, I was having a talk with my wife, you know, about the struggles and the risks and the fighting it took for me to become uh, a disabled intelligence officer. And she reminded me of the fact that I've been fighting my entire life and taking risks my entire life, um, which prepared me for the biggest fight of my life, and that's getting accepted in the CIA as a disabled officer. Um, I was the son of a, of, of a migrant worker. I saw my father struggling to put food on the table to keep us from the fields. Uh, I saw him take us from a one-bedroom house where we lived with one, nine family members to own in our own home. And going from a meter reader to a senior a uh, corporate salesman before he died. He never took no for an answer, and neither did I. This was the this was bred into me, which which followed me throughout my career, uh, especially especially in the Air Force where I started, uh, where I flew spy missions over denied areas during the Cold War. Um, I worked undercover tar targeting uh, Turkish mafia uh, to running running have a run in with the 17 November terrorist group uh, during Desert Storm, which prepared me for my fight to be recognized as a disabled officer. I'm speaking today not for my self-edification, but for all the disabled people out there that you too can accomplish the mission despite the insurmountable odds, and to those that are able that we too can do the mission. Though I can't discuss the details of my work or the locations, I can speak to you about the atmospherics, which is the heart and soul of what I faced to become CIA's first disabled operations officer with my type of disability. But the question I have for you is, what's it like to be disabled? How does it feel? Being disabled, you realize you can't do the same things uh, the same way that everybody else does. You have to learn to adapt and do things different, especially when I was first disabled. Uh, my wife and I decided uh, we had one child that we weren't gonna have another child, but after a while, we decided let's, let's try it and we did. And Part of my thing having a disability initially when I got disabled is I was ashamed. I was trying to hide it. I always kept my hand in my pocket. I didn't want people to know I was disabled. And I remember during the birth of our daughter, um, my wife told me, you need to tell the doctor that you're disabled. You need to tell her you have an injured arm. And 
of course, I didn't listen to stubborn me. So when my daughter was born, the doctor said, come on over, you can cut the umbilical cord. So I walk over, I took, you had my one hand, I was gonna cut the cord. She says, no, you need two hands. I said, I can't, you need two hands. She got upset with me holding my daughter. He grabs my arm out of my pocket and throws it out thinking it was gonna work. It laid there flame on the side of my body and her eyes got so big, I thought she was gonna fall over. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, and my wife just looked up, looked up at me and shook her head. I told you. So listen to your wife. That's the moral of that story. But then also I also had the same problem when my son was having his first communion. And part of the process was walking up in the procession uh, with the nun. And I remember this old nun, uh, old school nun was there. She was very strict. And she wanted us to cross our hands. Of course, I couldn't do that. And we're walking down the aisle. She kept telling me, I said, I can't, I can't. She grabs my arm again, pulls it out of my pocket, and it just falls. And all I heard was, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I was sorry. And she almost fell over. I had to grab her, actually. And, you know, lesson learned, you know. Don't be afraid to show your disability. Um, but I did learn a lot of other things. I learned um, how to change my daughter's diaper with one arm. And it was a, definitely a great technique. Uh, at first, she was moving around, and then after a while, she figured it out. Dad's got one arm up. Let him change the diaper. Well, my daughter just graduated from nursing school at Ohio State working as a nurse, so I'm hoping when I get old, she'll return the favor. Um, I also learned to play football with my son, and I actually learned how to tie a tie with one arm, which most people can't do with two arms. However, that wasn't my biggest challenge in life. My biggest challenge was proving to a disabled world that I was able to do the same things they did, sometimes even better. The road to my becoming CIA's first disabled operations officer was fraught with obstacles, sometimes with outright disdain for what I was trying to do. My efforts were initially met with innuendos, offhanded remarks, which turned into direct hostility as I neared my goal, being told I don't belong and I should quit, and afterwards being bullied by some. Despite the naysayers, I achieved my goal. I did what I set out to do. However, the agency wasn't overall unsupportive. They were supportive of my efforts. It was only a few select officers who were still caught back in the Stone Age that did not believe a disabled officer should be out in the field, especially an operations officer. I had a senior officer once tell me that when I was trying to achieve my goal, that everybody wants to be us, but not everybody can. This was kind of the prevalent attitude of some of the officers that didn't like what I was trying to do. The point of the story is that most people see a person with a disability, sometimes with pity, and assume they cannot take care of themselves. They never see beyond the missing arm, the leg, the blindness, or the paralysis to see what we really do and who we really are. Athletes, doctors, lawyers, former military, musicians, writers, and yes, even CIA officers. You know, when a person sees me, they barely see a man who can open a plastic bag in the grocery store in the vegetable aisle. You guys know how those plastic bags are. They're a pain in the butt trying to open up with two hands, but much less one. And But what they don't see is they don't see a man who could blow the crap out of a tannering of a target at 35 yards with a Glock, or who recruited spies, or who drove a stick shift through enemy fire, or whose reporting made it to the most senior levels of the government, or the disabled man who uses one arm to pick up and pin a man to a wall, or set up a network of disabled contacts throughout a city or the man who disguised himself as a beggar collecting information on terrorist bombing, or the disabled person who held the life of an insurgent in his one hand on his gun, saving the lives of his team, or who days before bloodied the nose of the former number three MMA fighter in the world because he uh, discounted my ability. But the key to my success was ignoring the critics and using my disability to my advantage. When a target saw me, they didn't see an intelligence officer. They saw someone who was not a threat, somebody who was approachable. By the time they realized who I was, it was too late. They were in my web. I may not look like other officers or act like other officers, but I was just as effective. I always pushed the limits right up to the line, which I think scared some, some of my disbelievers. However, in order to do my job, I needed to make many modifications to hide my disability or use it to my advantage. And you'll hear me say this throughout the lecture, that necessity is the, is the mother of invention. I had to blend into these environments. And so one of the things I had to do is I went to the office that took care of that. 
at our headquarters. And we tried to come up with a bunch of different methods to hide my disability. And they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure it out. So they ended up giving me a sling and said, go ahead. I'm like, that's not going to cut it. So I invented my own disguise devices. I developed a, a pull-away shirt with Velcro down the back. I could easily pull on and pull off. I had a long thobe that I developed with Velcro on different parts of it so I can slip it on and slip it off or slip it over a ballistic vest to hide my gun and take it off when I needed it. I um, also developed a method to make my arm appear as if it were functional using some Velcro and some modified gadgets along my side. Um, you know, I know we're not here to advertise a little bit, but I'm going to show you something. Velcro and scissors are what saved my life. Uh, I have Velcro. I use Velcro for everything, and I sew everything. And if you look at my back wall. Some of the photos are all put up with Velcro. And I always keep Velcro in my house. And my wife always just shakes her head about how much I love Velcro. My kids always make fun of me about it, but that's okay. Um, my disability and my skin tone also gave me advantage over other officers. I could blend in to 90% of the world. Uh, I could easily convert myself to look like a local, and within seconds look like a beggar in some of the most austere and dangerous environments in the world. From the beginning, my entire life was built upon actually becoming an FBI agent and not a CIA agent. When I was a child growing up, um, I used to watch those old TV shows with my grandfather. My favorite show was the story of the FBI. Those guys wore the cool suits. They wore the great shirts, the great shoes. I wanted to be that, and they went after the bad guys. That's what I wanted. Um, when I graduated high school, I realized either myself or my family could afford for me to go to college. So I joined the Air Force in law enforcement because when I finished my degree, that was going to be a leg up to get in the FBI. Um, there I met my wife uh, of 33 years. She's the love of my life, my biggest supporter, and she's actually my greatest recruitment. And she's been there supporting me throughout this whole thing and throughout my career. So when I was in the Air Force, I eventually finished my degree and I started applying for the FBI. And we moved to San Angelo, Texas, where I was an intelligence instructor for the Air Force. And there I received word that I made it into the FBI. And this was one of the best days of my life, aside from the birth of our child and my marriage. And then I went out jogging on a Saturday afternoon uh, to get ready for the FBI. I went on my normal route out in the middle of the desert when a truck ran off the road, hitting me at about 62 miles an hour. I was about three inches from being killed. He left me there on the side of the road to die, and it was a hit and run, I, and he didn't come back. So, you know, I was laying in the desert. I managed to get myself up, and I needed to look for help on the side of the road, but I was in the middle of nowhere. And I remember a car came by. And this lady in the car, older lady, looked at me and I was yelling for help. She looked at me and she kept going. That nightmare played itself out three or four more times where, before I got so tired that I just fell, off, fell on the side of the road. And when I woke up, there was an Air Force member and his wife there. They saved my life. And I remember I thought when I was injured that I got a broken arm. I didn't realize that my arm was paralyzed. And I was in the hospital laying on the, doctor, laying on the bed and the doctor comes in and says, and I asked him, I said, how long is it going to take to heal? Um, you know, I got to change my academy date for the FBI. And he looked at me and he said, son, you don't have a broken arm. You had the T1, C2, and C3 nerves pulled from your spine. And you've got another nerve just dangling from your spine. You're paralyzed. And the only hope you have is to have immediate surgery. So the Air Force scheduled me to have surgery at the end of December of that year. and it was about two weeks from the surgery, and it was a couple of days before my father's birthday when I got a phone call that my father was killed in a plane crash in Meridian, Mississippi. So I had to delay the surgery and go take care, identify his body, and go take care of his estate and the funeral. I did eventually get the surgery, and when I got it, it was too late, and I got very little movement back. To add insult to injury, the FBI calls me and said, hey, since you can't shoot a gun, you're out. Then the Air Force calls me and says, since you can't shoot a gun, you're out. Little did I know at that time, the rest of my care career would be spent carrying a gun to prove them wrong. I was unemployed and got a job up in Pennsylvania, which was short-lived because of budget cuts. I lost the job there. And I was unemployed again for nine months until I got on with the DOD Inspector General's office. 
which led me to the CIA's Inspector General's office. And we were doing an evaluation of the DO's counterterrorism center. And part of my job was to interview the head of the center who was Kofor Black. Now I remember going in and at that time I knew I wasn't gonna be an FBI agent, but I thought, hey, I could be an operations officer. This is what I wanna do. And cause I know they don't carry guns that much, but little did I know I'd be carrying a gun most of my career. So I sit down and I'm talking with Kofor and I asked him, hey, why do you guys do what, what you do? Why do you do the job? And he began to very eloquently tell me the story of the frog and the scorpion, about how this frog um, gave a scorpion a ride across the river with the promises he wasn't gonna bite him. Halfway across, the scorpion bites the frog and the frog asks why is there dying and drowning? He said, it's in my nature. A few weeks later, I sent an email to Kofor and said, I want in. Within the month, I was working in CTC. Um, this was about a few months before 9-11. So after 9-11, CTC set up a special program to go after the culprits of, of the 9-11 attacks, and I volunteered for the program. But part of that process was getting weapons qualified. So I, I went down to their training office and said, hey, I need to get qualified. So the lady calls down to the training section and tells them I'm disabled, I need some modifications and, to go through the weapons course. And they said, well, we got so many people going through due to 9-11, we don't have time to qualify somebody that's disabled because they're not gonna go to a war zone. Uh, learning not to take no for an answer, I applied five other times and got rejected five times. Then I finally found um, a local office there at headquarters that was willing to certify me because I had weapons, pre previous weapons experience with the military. Well, so which also brought another series of complications. So we went down the range. I had to figure out how to fire a lock, fix a jam, change magazines, and stay on target. So one of the things I did, and this was with one arm and much less with two arms. So I purchased two um, magazine pouches for the right side. I put them on the left side behind the Glock, and I had a Kydex holster. And I reversed the magazines. So when I had to load, all I had to do was pick up and push in. I could load the magazines. By the time I was done with that course, I had figured out how to load the magazine, fix a jam, and fire three rounds in four seconds. And that's with one arm, much less two arms. And I qualified. However, that qualification will be controversial later on in my discussion, and you'll hear about that. So now I'm all set. I'm ready to go to the war zone. And I go out to the war zone, and I'm at the clearing barrel. And I'm clearing my gun like I do with my one arm. I hear people talking behind me, hey, he's disabled. Well, what's he doing here? I remember turning around and telling them, hey, I qualified just like you did. I'm not going anywhere. And I walked away. And I remember the next day, um, I was going to get issued my uh, the keys to my vehicle. And our logs officer hands me the keys. He's kind of laughing. I said, OK. I didn't know why he was laughing. I walked out. He followed me with two other guys. They was up on top of the hill and my vehicle was at the bottom of the hill. I get in my vehicle and I look over and it's a stick shift truck. Then I started laughing to myself because when I was first disabled, I had a stick shift truck. And I remember my, my son will never forget this. He was three or four years old at the time. I trained him to shift up and shift down while I was driving that stick shift truck. And we, we actually did a pretty good job together. It was a, really a bonding experience. I eventually learned to drive with my knee and shift the truck without issue. So I started the engine and I took off, sped off out of the parking lot, drove past the guys, rolled down my window, kind of waved to them and kept going. And they sat there with their mouths open and didn't say anything. Later on, I had a supervisor talk to me and, and told me that there was some concern about my ability to handle myself in the war zone with a disability. And within 24 hours, I had proven his theory wrong. We were out running an operation uh, in a local village we usually had our security go out in front of us to take care of us and uh, to clear the way. So one night we're out early in the morning or about two o'clock in the morning. Security goes out, clears it, and we're coming out of this area. I'm in the back seat and I have a uh, translator as a driver and two other guys in the truck. And as soon as we pull out, there's an insurgent with the AK-47 pointing at us. Now, when you get when something like this happens, you only have seconds to make a decision. And right away, I called the security forces, and they told me the words that probably you don't ever want to hear. We're too far away. You're on your own. You have to deal with it. 
So I had the lives of these guys that I had to take care of. I was responsible for that. So I had three things pop in my head right away. The first thing was, A, number one, do I take this guy out with the truck? We were in the thin-skinned vehicle, which is unarmored. The bullets in the AK-47 would have gone right through the vehicle and probably get killed. Number two, I'm a good shot. It was pitch black. I would have to have, would have, to have made a 20-yard shot hitting the guy in the right place where he couldn't fire the weapon. I wasn't going to take that risk. Number three, talk my way out of the situation and trust my translator. Fortunately, I chose the latter, and we got out of there safely. And after that, I was never questioned about my ability in the war zone ever again. So after returning back to headquarters, I got a call from the deputy director of operations. He wanted me to come up to his office. He's a former Marine, and he knew that I wanted to go to get into the operational training course. And uh, he said, I, I want to help you. If that's what you want to do, I can help you with that. I thought about it. I looked at him. I said, sir, thanks, but no thanks. I want to do this on my own. I didn't want to be seen as somebody that had to take help to accomplish my goal. So it took me five more years before I got into the course. And I did. I got into the training course. Um, when I got in, the first thing they asked me is, do I need any modifications? I said, no, I'll handle it myself. As you heard me say before, necessity is the mother of invention. So what I did is I invented what I called the dashboard uh, Velcro pad. I was able to strap a Velcro to the dashboard of the car with a notebook on the left side. So if I saw any problems or anything out there while I was doing exercises, I was able to drive with my knee and take notes. I also invented the Velcro thigh pad, which I used to take notes during car meetings. And I also was able to use Velcro to uh, disguise my, my appearance, uh, making my, um, my shadow look like I was a normal person. I was able to make it look like the arm was functioning and it wasn't uh, for people that were watching me. I played this up so well that when I graduated, 90% of the instructors um, didn't know I was disabled. I was able to play it off that well. But this is when all the naysayers came out. In the middle of one exercise, I had a senior instructor stop me and ask me what the hell I was doing, that being a disabled officer in the field, I was going to put everybody in danger, that I should consider quitting and walking away. I looked at him and said, I'm not going anywhere. And guess what? I graduated. But that wasn't the end of the naysayers. Now I had to get weapons qualified for the next war zone. And uh, I called out of the office, did the qualifications. And I, I'll never forget this. This is one of those conversations in your life that you never forget. The guy on the other end told me, I know who you are and what you're trying to do. Your first qualification was illegal and should never have been done. You don't need to be in the war zone. And this is a quote. There's no way in hell you're ever going to fire in my range, unquote. I said, yeah, I will. Um, so this is one of the few times in my career where I called in a chit and I called in a favor. Within a week, I was on that range, and I qualified only missing two bullets off target without a single modification. When most, a good percentage of the class would fail, I made it through. Uh, I remember I got to my next war zone assignment. I was at the clearing barrel again, and I turn around, and there's that same guy standing there. He looked at me, and he said, I didn't know you qualified. And then he tried explaining himself, and I told him, I don't want to hear it. As I told you, we, being the disabled, are here to stay. We're not going anywhere, and I walked away. But not even 15 minutes after getting off the helicopter, I was called into an office by my new supervisor. And uh, he sat me down and began to berate me a bit, telling me, I know what, you, what you're trying to do. I know who you are, and I don't like you. He said that um, it's very dangerous out here. If you want to stay safe, you need to sit down and shut up and do what I tell you. Of course, I said, yes, sir. But I fought him every step of the way for the next six months. Eventually, I took his job and he was gone. So, you know, again, the naysayers were definitely out there. So in summary, just kind of gave you kind of a big, brief thumbnail about my background. But, you know, I spent my entire career in the CIA trying to prove I was able to belong. But what I failed to do was recognize my disability. And, you know, again, I was somewhat afraid to show the world that I was disabled at first. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I realized now that that was a mistake. I tried to hide my hand in my pocket. I remember a friend of mine told me, uh, Frank was telling me that I met, hey, you trying to be Mr. Cool, carrying your hand in your pocket? He had no idea I was disabled. 
And I realized at the time that I shouldn't be ashamed of it. I need to be able to do that. That's part of the reason why I'm doing this today is because I do believe that we do have something to offer. And in some, if someday you guys come across someone that's disabled, you might want to get to know them. You might be surprised. Okay. Thank you for your time. Well, th thanks so much for sharing your story, Rick. Um, it's really incredible. Um, I think the first thing that I wanted to ask and the most obvious question is, what advice would you have for someone who was disabled, who wanted to join the CIA? Um, has the landscape improved? Has it shifted um, during the yeah. course of your career? What, what, what advice would you give to someone that came across this video that um, wanted to join an intelligence agency? Sure. Uh, when, when I was first disabled, there were, no, there were really no major support groups out there for helping the disabled out. There were no uh, affinity groups or anything like that. The laws changed and times have changed since I was disabled for the positive. Um, the agency has their affinity groups, their disabled affinity group, which is really helpful. Um, they are taking better look at the disabled now compared to when I went through. Um, and the biggest thing is to be able to make those sacrifices to join the agency, but also be be out there, be aware that there are naysayers out there and not to quit. That is really, really important. I know like for us uh, being disabled, my wife and my family, we had no support groups. We had nobody to talk to us, nobody to go over that. We had to figure it all ourselves. And it was my wife who was the strongest one. She got us through this. But again, nowadays there are groups out there to help and they will help you get through the process and they will help you get in the agency. And the agency does have a good support group now for the disabled, it's changed a lot. And the other thing that I was really interested in was what what kept you going through all of this adversity? What was the what was the thing inside of you that made you keep going when other people would just have quit? Was it a role model? Um, was it was it just your personality? What 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 was the what was the the, the propulsion that that made you get yeah. toward your goal? I think the biggest thing was my father. Uh, he was like me, very stubborn and didn't give up. I mean, he worked himself up for me to migrant worker all the way through. He faced um, you know, some discrimination and other things and he fought, fought and I watched all this. And that's I think what gave me my, my greatest strength. But also what gave me a great, greatest strength not to quit was knowing that I had a wife and kids that I had to take care of. And again, I don't take no for an answer. Somebody tells me no, they close the door, I look for a window and I go through that window and I don't stop. I guess that that's that's the whole thing, it's not giving up and not stopping. And one one final question before we pass back over to Amanda. Did you ever get the opportunity to mentor um, disabled uh, officers or applicants or, or other people that were trying to um, mm -hmm. trying to get into intelligence agencies? Um, yeah, I did. A um, couple of things. Um, I tried to get a program started where I was going to bring in um, disabled veterans to try to be operations officers. Um, and, you know, it took a long time to even get the acknowledgement for that. And, and they're starting to do a lot more of it now. But I did have a couple opportunities. There was a, a lady that was disabled that was shooting. They actually called me down to look at this device and to talk to her. To, Kind of, kind of encourage her, you know, to get through the weapons course, and she did. Um, and you know, they really gave me a great opportunity to mentor her a little bit, look at the device that they were trying to use for. It was, it was a good collaboration, and it was very helpful. And I wish I would have mentored more people. I used to get notes from people uh, that were disabled. We'd have discussions, and I tried to talk to them about what the best career moves were, and what to do, and what not to do. Well, thanks for sharing your story. Amanda? Thank you so much, Rick. I mean, I really, it's very, very moving. And we see that in the comments that we're getting behind the scenes and really appreciate your honesty. I mean, some of those stories, I'm sure they're hard to tell. None of us like sharing when we're stubborn. I mean, but that same stubbornness has made you so strong, but I really, your your honesty is just amazing and really, you know, 
very touching. Um, and lots of people also want to say thank you very much for your service before we even get to the questions. Now, this is this is so great. You kind of you did answer this, but I wanted to spin it because someone was interested in how you reload a gun and you sure. described that that came in before you described it, but their follow up was so great and it leads me to a question. They said or don't you need to reload because you're such a fantastic shot that you get you always get your first shot in and i did wonder that are you more precise because it's going to be a pain to reload no i just it takes a lot of practice but i can't reload it's it's interesting because I'm, I'm shooting and when the gun runs out it, uh, it cocks back and i'm able to put it into my closer really quick and switch it and go back up and cock it forward and continue shooting. Um, but it, it takes some time. And But that's, yeah, that's definitely, I learned to be a good shot in the first place. So I didn't have to worry about reloading. But for the qualifications, that's part of the process. Um, yeah, I remember I just, I thought based on that, yeah, yeah, based on that, I remember, uh, you know, I recently took my daughter and her boyfriend out to the range and uh, we were shooting targets and, you know, I showed them my target and I told him I know how to use a gun, and uh, I remember he just smiled. But it, it works. He he knows better. <laughs> all right, now this um, there are about five questions in this question, and they're all really good. The first one is there a movie about you? Because gosh, it sure seems like there should be. No, not yet. I know uh, some folks have talked to me, but there's nothing in the works right now. Okay. Well, we'll get right on that. Um, oh, have you, you ever <laughs> have you ever thought about getting a robotic arm? I looked at that, and uh, I talked to I think it's a, a place out of Boston to try to do that. But I'm so used with the one arm, it, it it wouldn't do me it wouldn't do me any good. I mean, to be honest about it, it's it it wouldn't bring anything back for me. You know, I talked to him about it. We evaluated on the phone and it's it just wouldn't work for me how long um have you been without your arm 90, i don't mean to make you say how old you are 95 1995 yeah um and you and, come used to it and people are very intrigued by the mannequins and the mannequin heads in the background what are those what do they mean can you share them with us sure this is these are just kind of and these are based on, and sometimes not actual, but some of the disguises that I use that I had set up, and that's what they are. And I just kind of bring them out. My wife hates them, but I bring them out anyway. So, did you have a favorite um, disguise or undercover look that you felt you really pulled off super well? I mean, my my whole thing was being able to pull off uh, being a disabled person or a beggar. Um, that was my my biggest thing because of my arm. I was able to do that in a lot of environments. I mean, I could sit there in front of a bad guy and watch him for hours because I was sitting on the street with my arm out, you know, and among others that were there, I blended into the environment. They had no idea I was there. So that's kind of my, was kind of my favorite thing. That's really using, you know, it's like making an opportunity, taking an opportunity. That's oh great. yeah. Um, and, um, Someone wants to know what drew you particularly to war zone deployment? Because the FBI and the Air Force told me I can't shoot a gun. That was the first thing. Um, after 9-11 as well, 9-11 um, really struck me. Um, it hit close and personal. Um, you know, my wife and I remember it was when that day when as soon as it happened, we had kids. Uh, our, our kids were out to school and everything went blank. There were no phones or no way to connect to our kids or anything. I mean, we remember that day. It was, it was you know, those of you that lived through it, it was just incredible. And that kind of made, inspired me, like, I got to do something. You know, I got to get out there um, and being patriotic. I was in the military and, I mean, I still get a tear, believe it or not, every time the Pledge of Allegiance comes on or the National Anthem because that's how I believe and that's why I volunteered to do that when a lot of people wouldn't do it. Um, 
let's see, someone wants to know, and thank you for answering some of these questions, which may be super personal, but were you right-handed to begin with and had to change to be left-handed? No, fortunately I was left-handed. So that was a big advantage. So I got lucky in that way. Yeah. I know, as as lucky as that could be lucky. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. So you could, oh, that is, that is really something. Um, you mentioned now, were you a pilot? Did you say you piloted? No, pilot I was a, I was an in, intelligence and um, we flew on um, RC-135, some other aircraft. Yeah, and I didn't know. the Cold people, War. Yeah, people were wondering if you flew and had, I mean, it sounds like you get behind the wheel of an airplane and figure that out. And I oh, yeah, that I could if I could, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Um, okay, this is someone very personally who has unseen disabilities, um, mm -hmm. a disabled vet, very, very young, um, and is now filling an analyst role. And um, he has hopes to get back to the operational side soon. And is there any advice that you can give to prepare mentally, for him to prepare mentally to combat ableism um, and push through to make his dreams come true? Of getting back the out biggest there. Thing, and the biggest thing with that, and is, you know, when I was first disabled, the issue I had was, okay, I'm gonna go back to a war zone, because I did war zones in the military. and. You know, was I going to be able, how am I going to get ready for this? And it took a lot of mental thinking, a lot of studying, um, a lot of grit and determination. If you want to do something, you, know, you need to be prepared for all the consequences that surround it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Someone wants to know, what advice, uh, we have lots of advice questions, which is, is great, because clearly you have the wisdom. Um, what would you say to someone who has aspirations to join um, the agency um, prior, you know, coming from the Air Force? Um, I would definitely use, I would definitely put in the application, first of all. And, you know, the agency is definitely attracted to people with military backgrounds, which is a big deal. Um, but be persistent because I, I didn't mention it, but I applied for the agency probably three or four times before I got in. And um, I applied, I applied, they wouldn't take me, they wouldn't take me. And finally, I got in through the uh, DOD Inspector General's office, the only way I could get in. And I ended up, I think, applied like five times before I got in. So a lot of determination, using the military background, is all a big help. How many languages do you speak? Uh, I just speak Spanish. Spanish. But I did, I did learn uh, a little bit, a couple other languages, bits and pieces, enough to get me in trouble. <laughs> Which it has. Did your Spanish help you with that, or your English was one? Did one help you more than the other? Um, the English was a lot. I mean, I didn't go to a lot of Spanish places, and I personally did that because I didn't want to be stereotyped because I'm Hispanic going to Latin American country, so I chose other divisions to work in. That's such. I, I've heard that before. That's that's a a crafty crafty move. Um, how did now, it sounds like your wife has always been part of your dream, but when did your kids find out what you do? Oh, this is, okay. Um, my son was about 12 or 13 when he found out. And I remember after I told him we were overseas, we'd go out driving and he'd be in the back seat looking out, looking for surveillance and trying to help me. And he was really into it. Um, my daughter on the other other hand, um, when she was younger, um, going out to targets, I used to tell her, hey, we're at these diplomatic clubs. Hey, go play with that kid. Uh, go, go beat their daughter. And she didn't know what was going on. And eventually, you know, we got to meet them. And I did what I had to do. And then when she turned, she was a little bit older. My wife told her. And she looked. And she was a little bit upset. It's like, that's what he was trying to do. And then I remember one day, she came home, she said, oh, yeah, I met a, a friend from Korea. And I asked her, is it North Korea or South Korea? She looked at me like, dad, I am not gonna help you. <laughs> so, but yes, they both learned at a young age. What is, okay, so what do you ever think, gosh, I wish I was back in, this is, you know, it's crazy. I, you must be an adrenaline junkie. Um, I just, 
wonder. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I love the thrill of the chase. I'm able to do the job, but I was away so much from my family. Uh, I took a lot of time. I missed Christmases, birthdays, anniversaries, and wife and I talked. I mean, enough was enough. And I mean, the fight the fight was a good fight, but it was a tough fight. And after I got promoted the last time, we decided, you know, it's time to take care of ourselves and the family. So. What um. But I'm sure you follow all the all the issues. Uh, what keeps you yeah. up at night these days? National security and intelligence. National wise? security. Well, just the, the the Chinese is the big thing. I mean, and what they're doing. And I knew that even when I was in or before I was in. I mean, that's to me that's the biggest issue. I mean, technology, stealing of technology, all that kind of stuff, being invasive on our systems. I mean, to me, that's probably my my biggest. My biggest concern. Um, okay, of course, you've got to tell, we asked you when we first met you, what are all those cool posters behind you? Sure. Um, a lot of the posters I got are from the historian's office. Uh, my favorite poster is the one that the Laden wanted poster, which you can find online, but I got it. Um, let's see, some of them are from movies. And most of them are just advertising the agency that the uh, historian's office put out. Over here, I got some weapons that I collect. I collect weapons. These are a lot, a lot of OSS weapons that are collected over the years. Um, you don't have a bow and arrow there, do you? We have a collector a, who's trying to find. I, I have. I actually have the. Uh, I actually have the crossbow. It's one of uh, four that were made. Um, I got it up here on my wall, so I do have one. Wait, you're teasing us, aren't you? No, I got a crossbow. It's a little uh, Big Joe crossbow. Not the OSS crossbow. Yeah, it is. Okay, Not the I, crossbow I, itself, but the bolt. Yeah, I've got the bolt itself. That is, a, a, you know, the great white whale for one of our beloved collectors. So that is Hats off to you on that. And I hear your wife is not too fond of the weapon collection. Yeah, it's just all over the place. It's all over the house, but it's okay. She gets used to it. <laughs> um, oh, this is great. Here's a cool question. Um, what are some soft skills and um, character traits that helped you in your career? Really, the big thing for me is empathy. Empathy for a lot of the people that we met, that we went through, um, being able to see people for who they are. Um, I'll give you an example. Every time we go to an assignment, uh, let's say uh, we're at an embassy or something, I always get friends friends with the local guards because, I mean, people see them, they don't acknowledge them, but I always develop a relationship with them, the guards around them, because they're, they're the ones that are going to save your life someday, but I get to know them, their families. Um, we got to know the local culture. We're in one place where my wife did volunteer work and went out and met with the local culture of the people. And that's the biggest thing is getting to know your environment, get to know the people, getting to know their names. Um, you know, I take my kids out to, uh, with friends that were in a certain country for local food, uh, the way they ate, and ate with our hands sometimes and got to know them. And that's the biggest to me, the, the biggest soft trick is having empathy for those that you work, that you work around and the people that are around you. Because I can go in and do my job and totally ignore the guards or ignore the people, but no, that's that's, that's not it. You got to be able to have empathy, and those soft skills are really important because you never know when you might need them. Um, did you encourage um uh, your kids at all to go into this this sort of work? No, um, you know they they saw what I went through, but I let them each take their own direction. I mean, like I said, my my daughter. Uh, just graduated as a nurse. That's what she always wanted to do. And my son's in, in anthropology. He's finishing up his uh, his degree in anthropology. He wants to go in and do that. And you know, I, I let them kind of do their own thing because I I just didn't want to pigeonhole them, tell them you should do this. And they made up their own minds, and we're fine with that. When you were talking about access and empathy, did you um? And I, I know you certainly work to help, as you discussed, um, other disabled officers who might want to come on board. Did you also um, work with the um, Latino community, Latinx mm -hmm. community, 
do you um not i mean uh, i worked with their affinity group a bit but not as much as i should have because i was more focused on the disabled um i think this is the same i'm going to give this guy two questions because um i appreciate where he's coming from um, he was asking, would you disclose a disability that was invisible or would you go through the process and then reveal it? Do you have any advice? No, no, I, I, no, I would, I would disclose it. If you're going in for application, definitely disclose it. I mean, there's something wrong with that. Um, you gotta, you know, the trouble I had when I first got disabled is I didn't want to own it. I was ashamed. I wanted to hide it. And if you have it, you need to own it. And you need to work with it and deal with it. And people are going to have to learn to live with that. And if they don't, they don't like you for what you're doing or whatever for your disability that's on them but yeah definitely don't be afraid to disclose it don't make the same mistakes that i made um what was your favorite assignment um being being in the middle east area is probably my favorite what do you i mean had you imagined going um, there or was uh no not at all it was it's the culture and the people that we enjoyed i mean with every assignment we did that but that's because we got to know the culture. We got to know the people. And everywhere we went, that's what we did. And that that's the key to being happy and the key to our success. Um, you had mentioned to us before, and I don't know if you said it tonight because I my computer was glitching a little bit, um, about the special skill that your grandmother taught you that you she, used. She taught, me how to, she taught me how to sew. When I was in the war zone, that's all I could do is I'd sew. So I sewed my own stuff. With the uh, with, with Velcro, so that, and it worked. That is great. Do you ever like, or you know, do you, did you whip up Halloween costumes for the kids too? Ever? Oh my God, no, what, no? But I'm a Halloween fanatic. Um, I was won the local Halloween contest. I've got, I've got skulls from everywhere. I've got you know fake bones. I mean, I was won the Halloween contest. I remember one time we were shipping back our stuff, and the guy was going through my, because I have, actually have two real caskets, believe it or not. Oh. Um, so, so there were bones in there, and the guy's like, sir, uh, we can't ship back human remains. I'm like, no, they're not human remains. They're, they're Halloween props. Like, they thought they were real. So, But yes, I'm a fanatic. Um, oh, I want to go back on the question you said that um, the NC does also have support for Another important topic is a mental dis uh, mental disability, mental illness as well. And to me, with all the, the pressures of the war zone and everything, that's extremely important uh, to ask for help. So, um, Courtney says she's proud of you, Dad. She's very oh, nice. Oh, she's there. Yep, yep. Your daughter's here. Um, she made it. <laughs> you made it. Um, what do you? Folks want to know what you're doing now. Certainly, you've earned some some rest R and R, but yeah. I can't imagine someone with your uh, mental and physical energy is just getting ready for Halloween. No, I um actually started working well during retirement, but all, because of COVID, but I actually started my own company, uh, Alcor International, which company of one and my wife. Um, basically, just giving um, security advice to the companies. Um, staying safe and secure but i also developed a program um using the uh open source intelligence recruitment cycle i was able to convert that to a business recruitment cycle teaching businesses how to spot test develop and target you know the big fish the clients and seal those deals um if you could say something here's another advice one to 10 year old rick what would you say mm -hmm. Never lose your dream. Always stay focused. Keep your eye on the prize. And if you want to do something bad enough, you can do it. And don't ever give up. And don't let anybody ever tell you no. Like I said, my father taught me if they close the door, you look for a window and you break it down. And that's the way to do it. And don't give up. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh, people want to know. They want you, you know, to be the star of a, a movie about you. But do you have a favorite spy movie or TV show or, or book? Well, I'm a James Bond fanatic. I've got probably 14 or 15 signed James Bond posters in my room. Uh, I've got a James Bond pinball machine. 
um, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely a fanatic. Doctor uh, Doctor No is probably my favorite movie. I was but, I was uh, just gonna ask you who's your yeah. so is Sean Connery your Sean favorite Connery. Bond? Yeah, Sean Connery. It was awesome. So I'm a big big fanatic. I'm a big James Bond fanatic. So I oh, got everything yeah. James Bond. I got a whole James Bond room set up for myself. Well, we're all very excited about the new movie that they have to keep postponing. So oh, I know I can't wait for it to come out. Yeah, we we were hoping to do I, some a very special. We were going to do something really special in April, and uh, now we're maybe going to do something really special in November. But ah, it's crazy. Andrew, do you have any other questions for for Rick before we wrap up tonight? I, th I think um, the only other question that I have is um, you told us what you're doing now. Uh, what are you going to do at in the in the longer term? Do you have any plans or do you have any, you know, someone no. with your kind of energy, as Amanda said, with well, your drive? Um, sure. Well, one of the things I want to start doing, I'm starting to work on that, is to be able to do motivational speaking, to get out and um, – and I'm a certified instructor, so I like to get out and do some motivational speaking to help, you know, talk to the disabled vets or talk to some other groups or even corporations or other things. Just kind of do kind of a my spiel and do some motivational speaking. If that opportunity comes up, I'd love to do that. But that's really important to me to help inspire people to, you know, meet their goals, whether you're disabled or not. Uh, having that drive and not give up attitude. That's the way to do it. We all need some good motivation these days to, to keep going and putting one foot in front of the other. Are you familiar with the World War II spy, Virginia Hall, the one-legged um, mm -hmm. yes, officer? Yeah. 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 Um, one guest wanted to know if she was an inspiration to you, if you were aware of her, or if you became aware of her later. Oh, very much aware of her. I mean, she, was, she helped inspire me a lot. I studied her a lot. And her background and what she did. Um, no, I think that that was a huge inspiration for me because you know she was disabled. She was out there jumping behind enemy lines, running the radios. I mean, what she did was incredible. And uh, you know, she's probably one of the most inspirational women you know I've ever read about. And that really helped inspire me. Yeah, that was a big that was a big thing for me. Was what she did. It was. Um the theme for History Day for um, middle schoolers this year was very motivational and inspirational. And we did a lot of interviews on Virginia Hall, and it was always a pleasure to see these kids excited about this person who had overcome, you know, yeah. gender, and then she'd overcome a disability. It, it's really oh, yeah. quite a quite a cool story. Um, if folks want to reach out to you, um, can we forward their questions to sure. you after afterward yeah, that is, that's fine that is so oh um francis zettel wants to know if you know what she called her leg and i know and i bet andrew does do you know rick no i don't know no cuthbert cuthbert she called it cuthbert. i like that isn't that great i yeah. like that that's awesome all right they don't want to go but we will go and let people have their dinner we want to thank you Rick, this was just tremendous no interview. Um, we are so thrilled that um, HP could be our presenting sponsor for this. It really means a lot for us to support National um, Disability Employment Awareness Month. Really special for us. And we do lots of programs, and you guys know that if you've been here before. And if you haven't, check out the website. The next really cool thing we're doing is Andrew will be talking to a man, a wonderful historian who's just read, read, written a new book on the Nazi spy ring um, during World War II in America. So that's gonna be next Thursday at noon. It will be free and we can make programs free because of wonderful people like Mary Craft and HP. And also if you feel like making a contribution to our Mission Resilience Campaign, it will be doubled if you even if you give us 10 we'll get 20 between now and the end of the year so sorry for shamelessly promoting that but we appreciate any little thing you can do and rick you're the best thank you and 
Thank you. Such a pleasure. Appreciate it.